Hi everybody. I hope that um, you can hear me. Thanks for making time in what I'm sure are your busy schedules to join me for a look at um, uh, what parents need to know that their kids might never remember to ask. Um, give you a little bit of background about how I came to this. I'm the mother of uh, three college graduates and I also run a conferences and events company um, after being a journalist for most of my life. So I run conferences and events about technology and how they're used to solve different problems. So I kept very abreast of um, the educational and particularly the higher educational world through our conference section called Transforming EDU, which looks at the changes occurring on college campuses because of technology. But a few years ago, um, I wrote a book uh, that I'm basing this talk on called A Parent's Guide to College Life. And this was after having shelled out enormous amounts of money, um, enormous amounts of time and effort, and, and uh, saying to myself, gee, wish I knew now wish I knew then what I know now and how can I make that easier for other parents. So what I went and did was I asked 180 questions and I surveyed deans, academic deans, life campus deans, uh, professors, lawyers, doctors, all over and um, hopefully my sound is, I just got a lost sound coming, sound coming through. If it isn't coming through somebody just send me a text I think we're okay. So I compile the information from deans all over the country and um, hopefully be able to share some tips with you as you either head off to college or sending someone off to college or know somebody who's going off to college. And today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the parents' role, a little bit about some of the new alternatives to traditional colleges that I find kind of exciting. Um, we'll look at academics, health and safety, finances, your child's social scene and what you should play in that role, and finally the big uh, letting go word. So I call this first part. Now when my kids went to college, they called us helicopter parents, the ones that hovered every minute and were there um, asking why, why there was construction outside the dorm room even though you were a hundred miles from the dorm room. Um, and there are lots of reasons for being helicopter parents, only I think what I'm hearing from professors and, and college administrators now is it's gotten worse that rather than helicopters, parents are now drones. And, and for good reason. You, we are collectively the most educated generation of parents. Many of us have been to college ourselves and remember well some of the experiences. We're paying dearly for school. The price rises and rises um, uh, to the point where it's almost unaffordable. And accountability, while colleges have gotten more open about what goes on behind those walls, they're often not as accountable for process as we'd like them to be. When does your child pick a major? How do they figure out what courses to take? Who should they talk to? At the same time, we've got the most incredible communication tools ever. We could be sitting in our child's pocket, connected in class 24 by 7, if that's what we wanted to do. And um, so we know a lot more from further away than our parents did ever before. So that makes things a little scarier. You know, I talked to my parents once a week when I was in college, a collect call that just basically said I was okay. Um, it's a lot different now when your kids are pulling out their cell phones to ask you what you think in the middle of a class. It's also really important to understand how college has changed. Um, if you went to college, you probably had a major. That major hopefully had some relevancy to your life. I think what's happened now is um, what you learn in college is not going to be import as important as how you learn it. So for example, if you majored in computer programming and you learned C++ or HTML, guaranteed those are going to go away and you're going to have to keep those skills refreshed. So kids are going to college, I think, for very different reasons than learning just the job skills that they need and they've got to understand the skills won't last so the point is to learn how to learn and of course for us parenting does not stop once kids go to school and 
Just to back me up, the New Yorker cartoon, drone moms are the new helicopter moms. So um, uh, there you go. Um, I think it's really important to um, believe in yourself and, and believe in those first 18 years you spend parenting and that you have created a, a fully formed person who's going out the door. Your role is changing from one of um, the ruler to one of a, a friend and, and supporter. You want to be a knowledgeable sounding board, uh, sometimes even when you're not knowledgeable. And the one lesson I think I learned um, that was most important is that urgency is usually not. Uh, they will call you, they tend not to call you when they're having the best day or the best time of their life, but they will call you when something is absolutely urgent. Um, they had a bad day, this happened, they lost this paper, they lost this pen, their roommate did something. You will fret over this all night and by the morning they won't even remember that they called you and this conversation happened. So it's good to remember to take things in stride. If they call two or three times about the same issue, I would start to get a little worried. But typically, the sense of urgency isn't that urgent. And a bit of humor and um, can snap um, a, bad, a, a bad day right out of there. And a little unconditional love helps as well. So then I call this, uh, when do you start to worry? And I, you know, this is kind of um, just like the kids always would talk to me about gaydar. I call this codar or co-radar. When should you worry? I think when you're hearing the same story repeatedly, as I said. I also think um, there's this, I've made up this 15-minute rule. Those first day on campus when you get there with your children, there are studies at, that show that the, the relationships that they form in that first day, the roommates in their dorm, the people who they go to classes on those first opening sessions, the people they bond with during the um, opening days, will be their friends throughout college. So it's really important that you feel comfortable and they feel comfortable in those first days. Roommate issues surface quickly. Colleges have done a lot to obliterate the need for, uh, you know, kids introduce themselves on Facebook now, they know something about their roommate, they have certain choices. It's less of people being thrown together in potentially bad combos than ever before. And probably my other word of caution is I don't know a kid that doesn't roll their eyes really high when you say, don't worry, these are going to be the best years of your life because inevitably that's going to sound really hollow if, until they're out of school for about a decade, I think. Um, so try and um, avoid that. You're also talking about sending kids um, away from their home. And um, so you've got to think about, as, as each one left, you know, we always said, is this a home or is this a shrine to a kid that used to live here? What do we do with this room? And the bit of advice I would give to parents here is pretty simple. Basically, if you look at the college semester, whether it's tri-semester, whether it's double semesters, your children are going to be home or somewhere other than college campus about four months of the year. So you may want to keep that in mind, at least for freshman year. I wouldn't go making any major interior design changes to your home until you've sort of sorted out the vacations. I would also hope that, uh, as we say, it is a re it's a, not a revolving door, but a one-way door. But uh, we know that the norm now, more than ever, is for kids to return home after college, return home for summers, just because of the sheer cost involved in um, living on their own. Um, this next one I call ruling from a distance. And I like to say it didn't work for the British. They didn't rule very well um, remotely, and nor will you. So this big transition of yours is really from a ruler. And what does a ruler do? A ruler specifies what the curfew is, and it's raining out, you should wear your boots, and you're hungry now, you should eat. And those things are going to go away. And don't even try and approximate those things. but you are now giving them wings and it, it you know it doesn't hurt to uh you know to make a joke and say you know if you didn't wear your boots today you know how cold were you um we know that digital images say a lot um, we'll talk about social networking in a little bit and that certainly helps you get an idea of what your kids are eating drinking sleeping but um not always a perfect idea 
And I wanted to talk about a few alternatives to a college. And, and, and you know, again, I like to say not every college needs a quad and a tree. And this comes to, you know, the selection process in part, but it's never too late to reselect the trans kids transfer and their schools for everybody. So I thought I'd mention a, a couple of phenomena that are happening right now. One is the boon in community college, just because of the sheer price of colleges. Community colleges are really having, um, um, showing excellent growth and excellent preparatory courses to move on to a four-year school. So they're a good alternative for many kids who aren't ready. Um, I just spoke to uh, Western Governors University, a very different kind of university that's based on giving you life credit for what you know, that's really in tune with giving you some um, accommodations for whether you're a returning student that's older or whether you are a student who's had tremendous experience doing something somewhere. There are service schools uh, like Warren Wilson and Evergreen where, for example, there are no janitors or gardeners or cooks. Well, there are, but there are few. But each student in the school offers uh, a certain number of hours a week as a service. I think it's a great alternative for kids, in, in, especially who value things besides just the sheer academic. It always kind of drove me nuts that I was basically giving my kids license to sit on a bed for four years and study while other people clean their toilets. So there's a lot to be said, and I know that some colleges are actually learning from the service schools. Uh, Bob Carey, who used to run the new school in New York, um, just um, helped launch the Minerva Project in San Francisco. $10,000 a year flat fee for education, combination of online and experiential and classroom learning. There's a website called Academics Direct, which is a directory of every sort of non-traditional course that you could think of taking. And uh, that goes back to the, the MOOCs, the massively um, open online courses, which have become so much uh, a part of the news conversation lately. If I had to do a quick summary of MOOCs, I would say that version 1.0 of taking online classes without any face-to-face -face contact other than on your computer has not turned out terrifically well in terms of completion rates for students and, um, and um, you know, of people just finishing what they started. I think version 2.0, they're going to use new technologies, video conferencing, more collaborative tools, um, more part hybrid MOOC and real time to make it a more meaningful experience. So if uh, right now, I would say that if you're thinking of an online college, I think a student has to be tremendously motivated and that these courses are not quite scaling as quickly and as big as they thought. You know that there are travel semesters, there's experiential learning where you're uh, interning for a semester, and all these things help make um, college a richer experience and a more differentiated experience so they're not all the same all the time. Um, in terms of setting expectations, I think this is the most important thing a parent does um, and, and have some really clear conversa conversations like, like the sex talk but going to college about some very practical things. Who's responsible for what in finances? Um, as my dad used to say, it's great to have the kids put a little skin in the game too, whether it's their summer earnings or working during school. Um, don't compare. It's so easy, and I kick myself because I do it, we all do it, and you say, well, Jimmy works a 30-hour week and goes to college on a full scholarship. Why can't you do that? Um, bite your tongue and try so hard not to do that. And moderate your communications. As I said, just because you can be in touch 24-7 and know where they spent and track every expense on their credit card so you actually know when they ate their last pizza pizza, you can refrain from, from doing that. It's amazing the um, between geolocation on their cell phones and your credit card, you can build a record of your child's day-to-day, -day, including knowing whether they went to class. Um, and that's a personal decision that you're going to have to make over how much you want to do that and how much you want to let them be. What I would do right away is enter pertinent dates 
on your calendar. And that's not necessarily when their term paper is due, but it's parents' visiting days, it's uh, parents' weekends, it's when their vacation starts. I would resolve the big items. And by the big items, I mean, where do you bank? You may have a very nice banking situation during high school, but there's a bank that's a local branch in the town you're going to. Uh, you may have a, a doctor's plan that works really well in your hometown and may be just miserable where they're going off to school. You're going to look at meal plans. You're going to look at computer services. You may be a happy Mac family sending your child off to a school that basically supports PCs or vice versa. And the best thing you can do for this information is really pour over the websites. The websites are great. Um, I can't think of a school without a parents association to help you resolve these problems from your point of, of view. And resolve technology. You know, if Sprint is your family carrier now and there's no Sprint pickup on campus where you're going, well, you may want to get a different phone plan for your child and get an independent one. So resolve those things like um, network carriers, which um, schools tend to do for internet, but um, not for cellular. Uh, my kids and I used to joke on the first day of uh, orientation and every day, we'd say, so, okay, so what kind of parent are these people? And we kind of lumped them into groups. There was the darter. They were really busy running from place to place, looking at bulletin boards, looking at other dorm rooms, sort of taking notes and comparing. There were the exhausted ones. They usually traveled the furthest with a car filled with stuff, maybe crammed all the kids in one room the night before. And let's face it, moving into college is something that really wasn't meant for an older person to do. It was meant for younger people, so they look exhausted. There's the germinator, the ones that come in with Lysols and masks and brooms and um, all sorts of stuff. The list makers. Um, I remember having uh, one of our daughters Roommates' parents just hand me the list of what I should go and buy. The fixers, always good to have, and your kid or you or dad or whomever will be super valued if you bring a toolkit to campus that first day with pliers and tacky tape and a scissor and a ruler and a few nails and a hammer. And then, of course, there's the weeper who just um, has tears in their eyes from the minute the first frisbee is thrown and they realize that... Um, they're losing it. Um, if you ha have a, I'm going to check for um, any any sort of questions right now. Um, where is and the question is where is the best place for a current college student to find uh, scholarships? Well. Um, uh, a couple of places. There are a couple of websites, and actually, I will put them online and give you a URL afterwards. Um, and they are um, they're pretty comprehensive, like you know, scholarships for Albanians with uh, parents who served in foreign wars. I mean, they get pretty detailed. So I will definitely give you a URL to look for um, scholarships. In terms of um, academics. Let's just sort of briefly go over, I think, what your role is, as soon as I can get this thing to move. Um, parents get really scared about academics. They tend to abdicate. They tend, you know, they're good at like sort of making rules and the finances and the health stuff, but they get really scared about uh, what my child should major in, what courses should they take. And I really think even if you've never been to college, you can play the most important part in doing this. Uh, you know your children, you know their gifts, you know their strengths, you know what they're a little afraid of. You know that the school hires professional counselors but can't possibly know your child as well as you do. And that you need to have some checkpoints on your big four-year calendar, like when should they have a major? And sometimes some schools are more uh, lackadaisical about that. So by junior year, if your child is still taking intro to everything, um, those are the kinds of expectations you need to be clear about. You need to make it clear that um, this is not a four-year holiday, that they will work as hard as they can. Challenging themselves versus grades, I'll talk about in a minute because there's a, a lot of uh, to consider. Um, Maintaining good grades versus consequences. I don't think there's anything wrong within reason of saying, you know, if you're, uh, if, if I see that you're not going to class, if I, you know, if uh, if 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 
we start to question why you're doing so poorly in a class, um, th there may be consequences, and whether they're financial or vacation, I don't know. And the one that gets me, and I think we've given our kids some um, freedom that we would never give our parents, is the one where they come on and say, well, I didn't do well in the class because I just didn't like that teacher. And seriously, that's no excuse. We all have moments we don't like, and we take classes we don't like, and it is part of a well-rounded education, I think. I think, um, if anything, the American education system could be accused of maybe coddling a little too much and, um, and uh, saying, you know, everything's going to be easy and great. So your game plan should start with that course catalog. Really pour through that course catalog and understand graduation requirements. Do they have majors? Some schools don't ask for majors. How many credits do you need in your major? Do you take a major and a minor? Um, and you can look at the big picture and actually figure out a couple of different ways to slice and dice it so that if they want to take a few um, luxury classes, they have ample time. If they want to take a semester abroad, they are going to have to work harder during other semesters to make up some time. So I would do a couple of variations of what the four years might look like. Yes, they're going to change, but it's a really good exercise for you and them to understand that um, you're going into this with the belief that it's a, it's a four-year uh, experience, not a forever experience. And that really ends up mixing a lot of things. Um, you as a parent, expensive, you want to buy the most credits that you can. So let's say your school says you can take 21 credits a semester. Well, that might be okay if you're majoring in modern dance, but it might not be okay if you're majoring in chemistry. It's really hard to take you know, six chemistry classes a semester. So you have to look at balancing a course load that makes sense with them so that um, they're geared not for easy success, not success without struggle, but for success. And the other thing that um, I think goes on quite a bit in, in colleges is, I mean, we call it the grade inflation debate. Um, you know, professors get rated on a lot of sites. Rate right? my professor is, is a big one where kids go, word gets around on this professor grades easy, this professor grades hard. And professors in some times sort of uh, give in a little bit and, um, and uh, we'll just, uh, you know, sort of the Lake Wobegon syndrome where all the kids are above average. And so um, you may hear from your kids, I don't want to take that professor, that class gets graded too hard. And, you know, again, personal decision, but I would encourage a healthy balance of challenge. Some schools have done completely away with attendance policies. Many put all their campus lectures online, all the kids' notes are collaborative online. I actually would make a bet with you that um, you can not go to class at all and do reasonably well if you're a good student, but you miss something in that experience. So I think that whether your school has an attendance policy or not, you ought to. And you should expect your kids in their classes. Um, and as you're looking through that course catalog, make sure that the courses they're interested in are, are taught um, with frequency. We had an issue with one daughter where the one course she needed to graduate for the one year that she had left wasn't going to be offered till the following year. And I did. I had called up and said, look, that's your problem. I'm not sending her to a dorm again and a whole a tuition just for this one course. And they worked out a way to take it as, a, as an individual course. Which brings me to College 2.0. So probably the thing that's changed the most since I went to college, or some of you went to college, is technology. Um, these kids have access to the information of the world, forget about their college, in their pockets all the time, to all the web lectures, to all the online notes, to all the collaboration tools, and to social networking tools. And you know that colleges have Facebook pages just like your kids have Facebook pages, and they use it to communicate all sorts of things, and it's actually a great way to go in and ask a student, you know, what's life really like there. So I think social networking is great. Of course, you want to read the kids the um, Riot Act about posting things that they'll be very sorry about, um, and um, I think the schools do a lot of that too. Um, 
the schools are using instant messaging for mass communications, whether there's a football game tonight or what's for lunch in the cafeteria or whether, you know, there's been a problem on campus. Um, a lot of schools have what we call mommy cams, just places where you can just look on a webcam, go to Cornell's if you want to see a fun one, and kids are just waving hello to their mom and dads. Uh, Ebooks versus textbooks. It's really a personal decision. I, I think that there's a group of kids who will just always love scribbling in the margins of real paper, and there are those that like carrying as little as possible all the time. Um, right now, the cost is cheaper on the ebooks once you buy the device, um, but you don't resell them the way you do textbooks. So it sort of balances out, but it's a big discussion, and I would say a way to get ready for it is to take an ebook now if you go to iTunes College section, um, iTunes EDU, or you go to Google EDU, download a course book and see how your kid feels. You'll go through the, it used to be, should I bring a PC, then it was, should I bring a PC or a notebook, and now it's, should I bring a PC, a tablet, a notebook, or a phone. I would say for college, you want something with a keyboard um, that um, you really can't thumb fast enough, and styluses aren't quite good enough yet to depend on input other than keyboarding. Um, uh, but if you have students with learning disabilities, some of the voice recording devices and pens that record are really fabulous alternatives. Um, I know I'm skipping around to so many things. Um, grades, just so you know, you have no right to uh, see your children's grades unless that's a deal you make with them ahead of time. There is a Privacy Act that uh, means they don't have to share. We always told our children we didn't really care about the Privacy Act, that we would share their grades, and they were very happy to do that. But again, it's a conversation you should have. They may not understand, or they may understand, but you should understand that there are different kinds of classes that involve different amounts of effort. Um, there are survey classes that are kind of wide-ranging, labs that really involve a lot of hours in the class, lectures, workshops, and again, understand what the class entails in terms of hours. And I find the boys are always better at this than the girls. My son would go to college, and the first question he'd ask the professor is, how are we being graded on this class? The girls would just want to know what they were going to learn. Um, so they should get the skinny on what's involved in the class. They should mix um, classes that are heavy science versus the English and, 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 and you know, some of the uh, more reading intensive. You can't possibly read you know, 7,000 classes worth of Chaucer and Shakespeare in one semester and live. So, and take a challenge class. I really believe. Take something, and to my kids, I was pretty practical. I would say I'd like it to be HTML or statistics. At the, when they went to school, I thought those were the big things, or, or a foreign language, um, the skills that they would really need. Make sure you understand dropping, adding, and withdrawing. It differs from college to college, but the essential rule of thumb is within two weeks, your kids have to be pretty well set on what they're going to be taking, or you'll start paying penalties. Uh, we talked a little bit about different programs, but um, again, the rule of thumb is if your kids take some of these enrichment programs, they may end up having to make up some uh, credits during the year. Learn about the special resources on campus. This is all well documented on websites. There's everything from how to organize yourself, which most kids really fall down in, especially with long-term projects, to academic resource centers, learning specialists, special adjustments. If you feel you need any of that, I guarantee it's on the college website. You don't have to be a rocket science to figure out how to get out in four years. You've got a certain number of credits required, at least in most schools. You've got a certain number of credits you come in with, maybe AP or um, transfer students. You divide it over the four years. And as I said, just be aware. The earlier you know your major and the earlier you know penalties for doing some of the other things, the better off you'll be. Uh, goes without saying, do not call the kids. Uh, professors on their behalf. Um, I think I did it once in four years because of a death in the family, so I will say I did it once, but it's so tempting to say my kid really doesn't understand or they're very upset. Just really try not to do that. Don't decide their schedules, but you can certainly have input. It's a great dinner table conversation. Um, editing their papers, it's always hard, especially if you're a well-educated parent. Um, uh, we always try to find a happy medium 
read them, make some suggestions, but really don't go through and, and, and do the rewrite. Um, but certainly it's great to talk about the issues that they're thinking about. And if they'll talk to you about it, how great is that? You should be honored. Miscellaneous things, the more sports they're in, grades, grades get tough. Sports take a lot of hours. Extracurriculars, if you have a student that loves extracurricular activities, just keep your antenna up if they're uh, burning out. Um, majors, they do get a counselor assigned to them. If the counselor doesn't reach out, they really should. They should not be shy about that. The number, uh, at least of uh, three years ago, was 50% of kids do not graduate in four years. Um, and then a lot of schools now actually have senior thesis or independent projects versus a senior year. And I'm a big believer in the senior thesis because I think, A, it's a great um, migration to job skills, and B, turns the table where they're just not absorbing the information anymore, but they're actually putting their mark on academia. And I think that's what you want. So if there's any way they can do independent studies and they're up to it, I think it's great. Work study, if they, if they can avoid a freshman year till they sort things out, it's great if you can afford that. If not, um, there's advantages to working on campus in a campus job. Campuses are much more forgiving about preparing for tests or taking a day off to study than um, an outside place would be. Outside places tend to pay more than campus places. The other thing about campuses that have changed, probably in addition to technology and in part because of the technology, is the fact that they're um, the cashless campus. So you're sending your kids to school with basically one, one card that does everything from getting them into their room to paying for their meals to getting them into the bookstore. Um, they really have to understand that this is costing somebody something. Um, we had, one of our sons would buy a pen every time he forgot one to go to class. He'd just go to the store and use that swipe card. A lot of the swipe cards are now good in the towns also. So they really have to understand that this card is not to be abused. Having a limit on it would be great. Um, they will get offers like crazy their first year of school for 0% interest on credit cards. That lasts about three months and then they start getting charged exorbitant and they fall for it every year. So while they are more savvy about money than ever, they're not that sa savvy. Um, there are lots of sites that I'll give you at the end also that will um, take you through how to set up an estimated budget with them. Um, it really matters on where they go, whether rural, city, how much there is to do on weekends, how much there is to do on campus. Um, moving on to health and safety, colleges have come a long way in offering a lot of robust services. Read about them on their websites as well, whether it's um, counseling, whether it's where do they go after hours when they're sick, whether there's a fee for services, whether they need to know when to leave the university. And this gets really tricky, especially if kids are feeling um, depressed or having mental um, problems, coping with stress over um, how much to use the school and how much to use outside services. And it's worth thinking about because as much as school tries to keep things private, I mean, the work study student is taking the input for who walks into the infirmary right at the desk. So it's something to be aware of. Safety, most of this is self-explanatory. Best thing you can do is make a personal inventory of stupid things that they're going to forget to do, like all their credit card numbers, bike numbers are sometimes the campuses will etch them on for you, computer um, ID numbers. And if you, uh, if I go back to that picture, I mean, this is what a college dorm looks like. The door, the window's open, the key's under the mat, the lights are on, the computer's on, their notes saying when I'll be back. So they should try and be a little smarter about um, not being a sitting target. And um, as I said, for long distance parents, Parenting, I mean, you could be there every minute of the day uh, knowing where they were. I would suggest not doing that. But, you know, make some decisions that you're going. Um, Skyping is great. When we had holidays, the kids couldn't be at. We uh, set up Skype at their place and they ate a meal with us, or at least they put a picture up and pretended to. Um, they tend not to love email very much. They do love texting. Um, and uh, so I would get comfortable with that. And, um, 
the cell phone call, you know, I, I, I'd keep it to a minimum um, and, um, you know, hear their voice a few times a week. But, uh, you know, go with your gut. And just again, remember, they won't call you when they're having a good time. Um, so the way I th think about the college dorm experience is sort of like going to the army but with no supervision. You've lost all privacy. You live in this crazy world with um, all different type of people. If your children are used to living in their own rooms, um, good luck with that. Um, there will be highs and lows. And it's really up to you to make them see that there will be highs and lows and this will be over. They all have resident advisors who have been trained to deal with um, emotional issues. Some of them will want to know about fraternities or sororities. Again, I would say to you, when sororities and fraternities are good, they do great community service, the kids study together. At their worst, they're party drinking um, issues. And what you can do is actually do some looking around on, on the Facebook sites. And um, you can look at the expenses. Fraternities can actually be really expensive to join and can take considerable amount of time. So I would, um, you know, think if your students really determine, find a good one there, um, as opposed to bad ones. And there actually is um, npc.com does uh, rate them. Um, eating, you could need a PhD just to choose a meal plan, but it's good to know your child's eating style. If they don't eat a lot, you don't want to be overpaying. Um, there is the freshman 15 when food is free and available all the time. The schools have gotten really, really good at balanced diets and healthy snacks, and they've gotten much better about multiple options. And typically, they have a grace period where you can choose one option, and after two weeks, say, maybe this isn't working. Let's Maybe they want to buy more in the supermarket and cook more in the kitchen. Um, School records, something to really be careful. I'm looking for my time here. Um, Shauna, why don't you tell me how much time I have? Because I oh, um, don't want to run over. Um, school records, it's really important um, and needs to be understood. Does a drinking offense go on the record? Does a smoking marijuana offense go on the record? Does a fighting on campus go on the record? And most campuses have developed some sort of very clear rules, whether it's three strikes or whether it's immediate dismissal. And you, again, need to have that conversation with your kids. And I will, actually, I did a, um, a silly um, um, test about how much you know about your college kids. And I've put it up online um, at transformingedu.com and basically asks you how much you know about your kids, and then you get rated into three groups. Uh, maybe you should get to know them, uh, you're just right, or maybe you should get a life of your own. And so just for fun, you might want to um, visit that. And um, with that, I'm going to end formal comments. And I'd be happy to take questions. And I'm going to look through for that scholarship URL as well. Um, OK, so for financial aid, um, the best place you can start, of course, is FAFSA, um, which is the government program, F-A-F-S-A dot E-D dot gov. And um, there are, uh, um, I will find, um, I will find the other one that I was talking about, where, where you could actually get tremendous information um, on, on, on some of the other places for scholarships. Um, I'm going to have to send that to you. That will be on the Transforming EDU website as well. Um, you see students. Um, well, I'll let, are most people Parents of college uh, of college students who are getting ready to go still in high school. Uh, anybody want to answer? Okay. Um, in that case, um, I think um, 
what I can do is, you know, urge you to um, visit Transforming EDU and take my little test. If you do want to buy the book, you can go to Amazon.com. The book is called A Parent's Guide to College Life. I would be honest, I would be dishonest if I didn't say um, it's slightly outdated, but it gets most of the um, important stuff across, and I think the part that's the most outdated is the technology component. And um, with that, I think I'll let you start your dinners or your evenings or your afternoons um, early, and um, I'll give us another minute for questions if anybody's typing, and then if not, I will just click on uh, ending the presentation. Oh, and I see I have some questions that am I not seeing? Okay. Shauna, me, Shauna, since I can talk to you, maybe you can tell me if there's a question I'm missing. I don't see any questions in the chat. Oh, here we go. Um, yep, starting in the fall. What if you have a debit card? Hmm, yeah. So um, I think debit I think debit cards are a better way to go, for at least for a freshman student. There are two arguments. Um, a debit card is great because you put a certain amount and then they're done with it. The downside of a debit card when they get out of college is that they've got no credit card ranking or rating, which makes it hard for them. So I would think about starting with a debit card and then somewhere in the middle um, switching to a credit card so and start to build up good credit. Um, and then I've got a current college student, and let's see, and other questions, very informative. Thank you so much for purchasing the book. The scholarship URL, I will have to, I will have to look that up, and I don't want to read the book online in front of you, but I promise I will get that to you and directly to you. And somebody just asked that if they've missed the first 20 minutes, is there a way to view it? And I'm going to ask Shauna to answer that. Sean, is there a way to view these where they're archived? Uh, yes, they can view it on demand. And Shauna is giving me the URL um, in one moment. On College Week live. So just go to College Week Live and you'll be able to view any part of this presentation you missed or if you thought it was that much fun, uh, you, if, you want to watch it again. And then somebody asked, are there things you would recommend to start? And I would say starting's really big and there, there are sites like the Princeton Review, like Kaplan, like Uniglo, like College Week Live. Start with some big questions. Um, uh, does your child want a big school or a small school? Do they want a city school or a country school? If they don't know, I would simply start just taking a visit to each one of those, even if you don't travel far, because they'll get the idea of the difference and something will resonate with them. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think uh, I, I would definitely visit not every campus, because that would, might be financially impossible, but the ones that your children are really interested in, I would try and get there. I would remember, again, you know, they will roll their eyes a lot and say, Mom, that is the dumbest question I've ever heard. I can't believe you asked that. So you might want to separate off from them. Some schools actually do have separate tracks for parents to take the school visit uh, w without... Um, without you, uh, without the kids. And the kids like it because they feel more comfortable asking questions when you're not around. Um, little tidbits of wisdom. I know this is going to sound nuts, but I learned most of what I learned about college by looking in the dumpsters. I know this sounds crazy, but you go to where they throw out the garbage. If you see a ton of beer bottles, 
you know, my antenna went up. If you, um, if you see just wasteful waste, um, you know, you know you have one cut of student population. So you, and I look at the bulletin boards. Look at the bulletin boards because you can see what kind of extracurricular activities there are, how many people are engaged in things, are there leaders, are they doing the kinds of things your kids care about. So if I have to say, on your college visit, Look in the garbage and look on the bulletin boards, and um, don't be afraid. Kids really love to talk to you about their school. You know, just just be the interviewer on the street. Um, and um, yes, and I'm going to type. Um, for the woman who keeps uh, um, who wants the scholarship information, I would start here. Edu dot gov. I'm not sure how to answer that, so that they. Um, um, Atiya, I think that's your name. I will get that to you. I have your email. Um, and. Um, Again, I think that about does it. Are there things you would recommend to start connecting the student with other students over the summer before they start school? I absolutely would do that. And the schools have been good about that. They actually are now introducing the kids, a majority of them, on Facebook. And again, just introducing them, they're going to end up sort of just saying, I don't know what to ask them. I'm embarrassed to ask them. You know, that, that's often a problem. So something you can do is just say to them, hey, why don't you just figure out who's going to bring what so you don't have two of everything. You don't need two toasters and you don't need two microwaves and you don't need, you may not need them at all, but you can start on that, hey, I have a stereo or I like music, um, here's where I live, um, I have some great curtains. There are things, and I made a list of things kids often forget to bring that you have to remember their health records, a toolkit, like we talked about, screwdrivers, power cords. You never have enough outlets in your dorm room. It's almost a given. A labeler or an indelible marker so that they can label things that are important to them, like their computers and their books and their notebooks. A shoe rack, which very few dorms have. Uh, those plastic cabinets, because they never have enough room for things. Most important, a basket to carry their stuff to the bathroom, just one of those little plastic buckets where you put all your shampoos and soaps so that they can bring it back and forth with them. Um, and sticky tacks, so you don't have to nail in things. They will be charged for damage at the end of every year, so um, you want to avoid um, totally rebuilding the room um, and be as creative as you can with cinder blocks and cases and sticky tape, and that all comes into... Uh, importance and remember you're never too far from a Bed Bath & Beyond so you don't have to buy everything at once but every store like Bed Bath & Beyond, Walmart, Kmart, Target, they will all put out lists for your college students and what they think they should have. Um, I think probably the most other important thing is two weeks worth of underwear because if they don't wash anything else it's good for them to have two weeks of underwear and rain boots. <laughs> um, and other things, you know, to do over the summer, um, a lot of schools send out, you know, sort of the intro reading list. It wouldn't hurt to get a leisurely start on some of that. They, won't, they are really surprised, I think, at the amount of reading that they have to do. For some, it's a total shocker. And just... Um, if your child has picked a roommate you don't think is a good match, do you allow them to room anyhow? Yeah, or do you encourage them to go with a random? So what I would discourage, and this is a personal opinion, is rooming with somebody they know already. I think it really wrecks that college experience and it sets them up unfairly. They will be labeled by every other kid as, oh, the two from Chicago. And it will hurt their chances of making other friends. So I think um, one of those two should say, you know, I think for this first year we ought to try and live with somebody else and, and take the random. I have never seen the two that know each other integrate really well with a room. They're always sort of a click from the beginning.
and um, good. I could go on and on. Best, great years, great years. I should I should end by saying these are really wonderful years because what you establish is a conversation with your children that will last the rest of your lives together. And whether it's as lame as, and I'll just give you an example. One of the most honored moments in my life as a parent of a college kid, when she called and said, should I take criminal justice 101 or the, the, the penal system? And I said, gee, I really am not you, and I'm not in classes, and I don't know. I can tell you that some of the thinking I would go through in making the decision and based on what you want to do. And that's what we did. And I was so honored that she called, but I was careful not to dictate the answer, but to have a conversation. And we still, to this day, I mean, this one has actually gone through law school and, you know, I ask her about her day. And just like your eight-year-old, it's sort of, uh, unless you ask a specific question like, oh, did you try that case today? Oh, did that thing get resolved? And then you'll find the more that you can keep them talking about their classes, um, the better you, you are. Um, I have to say that um, my youngest went to Reed College in Oregon where we were required to read uh, the Odyssey with them as before they even got to campus. And I said, oh, I can't believe that I have to read a book now too. But it was so great to sit in this orientation class as parents and students talking about the Odyssey together. And it gave us a comfort level of talking about other classics as they went on. So, you know, if you want to co-read with your kids and you're interested and they'll let you, more power to you. And with that, I think I am going to hit the end button. Have a great evening. Um, stay out of the snow if you're in it and in it if you want to be in it. And um, Good luck, and um, uh, you can get in touch with me on the Transforming EDU website with any other questions. Thank you so much.